African Hub. Oh, thank you, Amy, uh, for recording. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to also introduce the African Hub of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, otherwise known as GAN. So GAN is a global alliance and movement dedicated to ensuring an environmentally sustainable future by reorienting ourselves away from an exploitative and ultimately self-destructive relationship with nature to one that honors the deep interrelation of all life and contributes to the health and integrity of the natural environment. An essential step in achieving this is to create a system of jurisprudence that sees and treats nature as a fundamental rights-bearing entity and not as mere property to be exploited at will. As the African hub of Ghan, we work to promote the universal adoption and implementation of governance and cultural systems that recognize, respect, and enforce the rights of nature, particularly on the African continent. As part of our work, we will be hosting events such as this one to explore different aspects and approaches to earth jurisprudence and rights of nature in the African context. Today, we are starting with an introduction to these topics by our three excellent panelists. First, we have Cormac Cullinan. So Cormac is a practicing environmental lawyer, director of the Wild Law Institute, and founder and non-executive director of the Biodiversity Law Center. He has worked in more than 26 countries and has drafted environmental treaties, laws, and policies for many governments. His book, Wild Law, a Manifesto for Earth Justice, pioneered earth jurisprudence and has played a significant role in informing and inspiring the growing rights of nature movement. Cormac played a leading role in the drafting of the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth, is a founder and executive committee member of GAN and a judge of the International Rights of Nature Tribunal. He will be followed by Ngozi Unwigbe, who is a specialist in international environmental law, policy and ethics with a research bias for the role of indigenous knowledge in environmental sustainability. She has been a key participant in United Nations working groups on human rights and the environment, as well as a member of the technical review committee under the IUCN. She is a member of, she is a, member of a number of professional bodies, including the IUCN Ethics Specialist Committee, the Earth Law Alliance and Global Ecological Integrity Group. She was formerly an environmental policy research fellow at the United Nations University, Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, based in Accra, and is currently a professor at the University of Benin in Nigeria. Lastly, we have Natalia Green. Natalia is from Ecuador and studied her Bachelor of Arts at Hampshire College, Massachusetts. She holds two master's degrees, one in social science and one in climate change. She was president and is now vice president of the Ecuadorian Coordinator of Organizations for the Defense of Nature and the Environment. She is also a member of the Executive Committee of GAN, coordinator of the Alliance's global team and secretary of the International Tribunals for the Rights of Nature. She is a consultant of the Sacred Waters Initiative and a promoter of the collective Frente al Ambiente. So a warm welcome to our panelists and to you all as the audience. Um, in terms of the structure of today's session, each presenter will have about 12 minutes to speak in the order that I introduce them. And then we'll have some time for questions. So please do post any questions you may have in the chat. I'll now hand over to Cormac. Thanks. <coughs> Uh, thanks very much, Katrina. Um, so I've been asked to just give a, a brief introduction to the subject. So what I'm going to use is an analogy. Um, if, you, if you imagine human beings as being like a leaf on the tree of life. Um, so there's been a long evolutionary process that has produced this a tree of life, which has many branches and many different life forms, but it's all ultimately connected. And we one of the more recent additions to that uh, tree of life. And we claim to have human rights by virtue of the fact that we exist as human beings, even if our governments deny us those rights and even if our courts don't recognize them. So what we are saying is in essentially uh, with the rights of nature movement is that if we as humans, one of the little leaves at the top of the tree want to have the rights to exist and to flourish, we must recognize the rights uh, of the whole tree to exist and flourish because if we cut away the tree beneath us or don't recognize it has a right to exist and don't protect those rights, then there's no future for the leaf on the top of the tree. But let me start by talking about, broadly speaking, what 
is we mean by earth jurisprudence. So earth jurisprudence is not intended to be a branch of environmental law. It's really an approach, uh, an ecocentric approach to the whole subject of law and governance. Um, and the idea is that it reflects the understanding that we humans are an integral part of and have evolved as part of this magnificent planet that we call Earth. So we, we, are, we are born, if you like, into an ordered universe and, and nature um, ordered, uh, orders itself and that if we want to flourish um, as part of that community of life, we need to pay attention to the how the system as a whole works. In other words, if you're a member of a community, you need to understand the laws of that community and you need to live in respectful, you need to coexist respectfully with the other members of the community of life because each one of them has their role to play in completing uh, the whole. So one of the things that makes this approach particularly powerful relative to existing approaches is the fact that it is based on a more accurate understanding of the universe. So most legal systems in the world today define human beings, corporations, and states, in other words, humans and, and what is called juristic persons, um, as the only subjects capable of having rights. And all of nature is defined as an object or objects, or put another way, property. So this, as as is often said, is a bit like the situation when humans def define other humans as objects. They were called slaves. And it's very easy to see that the slave owner has who has all the rights will exploit the slave who is property and maybe bought and sold as an, as an object. And that is the same exploitative relationship which most legal systems have hardwired into society by, by not recognizing that anything other than humans or juristic persons have rights. So th that is an idea which uh, came to, to prominence in Europe in the so-called Age of Enlightenment. And at that prior to that, um, most uh, European societies, many people in Europe, like elsewhere in the world, understood nature as a, a great mother, if you like, as, as a source of all of well-being, of food, of nourishment, of shelter, and that the emphasis was on maintaining a respectful relationship and with uh, the Earth Mother and honoring honoring her. So the, it was a it was an attitude of respect, and it was seen as very very important to maintain good relations with the other members of the Earth community. This then changed to the idea that the universe was something like a mechanism or a clock, and there were sort of models made of it, and that it could be manipulated by humans to our advantage. Now, if that were true, it would make some sense that only humans were subject and the rest of the universe was an object because it was just a mechanism, it wasn't alive. But of course, that understanding has long been abandoned by scientists and ecologists because we know it's false. Um, we, are, we are part of this amazing community which is created by the interrelationships between all the members of that community of life. But this fallacy that humans are separate from and superior to nature, and that nature is some kind of mechanism or collection of objects or natural resources, if you like, which exists solely for humans, persists in the law and in the economic systems. And that is what we are, are trying to change because the Earth jurisprudence approach is based on a far more accurate understanding of. Uh, how the universe works, which is both ancient in the sense that um, uh, cultures have known about the, this for a long time, these perspectives still persist in many indigenous cultures, but it's also consistent with modern um, understandings, whether it's uh, uh, quantum um, physics or, or ecology, the, the importance of interrelated, the interrelationships which hold everything together, and the fact that human well-being is entirely derived from our relationships with the other beings which form part of this community of life. So the ultimate perspective here is to align how we govern ourselves with the greater laws which exist, with the systems or principles of governance um, which order the universe. So in order to explain this, I use the term great jurisprudence to refer to, to that which already exists, the principles, if you like, of, of of physics, of, of chemistry, et cetera, which determine how the universe works. So jurisprudence 
means really philosophy of law or, or derived from the Latin word for um, law juris and prudentia meaning wisdom. So in a certain sense, although we're speaking about law here, this thinking is wider than law. It's simply saying that we humans need to re-remember that we are an integral part of this incredible community of life and that we need to live in accordance with its rules if we're going to flourish. So this great jurisprudence, if I can put it that way, is something which doesn't have, it's, it predates humans. It, it, it's a, embedded in the fabric of, of the universe. And we can, we can see it, we can deduce these rules, if you like, by observing nature. So if we look at nature, for example, we can see that diversity must be one of the principles um, governing the universe, because everywhere we see a diversity of, of, of life forms, and we can see that life as it evolves tends to, to diversify into more and more forms. Um, so then the question becomes, of course, how do we apply that? And although we talk about earth jurisprudence, it, it's more correct to say earth jurisprudence is plural, because every society, every culture is different and, and also ecological conditions vary around the world. So each society needs to find its way of looking at the, the, at the great jurisprudence, looking at how nature functions, and then working out how to develop its own approach to governing the people in that community so that they behave uh, in an appropriate way to the other members of the community of life. So these, these um, perspectives, of course, are, are present in many, indigen in many indigenous cultures. And so this, this idea of Earth jurisprudence is simultaneously an ancient idea and um, it's, but it seems very new to people who've been brought up in this Western way of thinking. So one could come up perhaps with a few general principles of earth jurisprudence to just give you a few. Um, although each jurisprudence may vary from culture to culture, they would all have common characteristics. For, for example, all would re reflect a recognition that the universe, rather than any human institution, is the source of the inherent fundamental rights. We, we have rights by virtue of the fact that we exist. Um, and uh, as uh, Leonardo Boff, the, the, the famous um, liberation theologist from Latin America said, all that has come into being has the right to be. If one, has, if one is part of this community of life, then one has the right to continue playing a role within it. Um, and these rights are essentially inalienable. In other words, it's not up to humans to, to say that they don't exist and to deny um, another creature or another species the right to exist. And that also means that activities which prevent other me members of the Earth community from playing their roles can be seen as unlawful. In the same way as we talk about violations of human rights, we would see these as violations of inherent rights of other beings. And when there are conflicts between the rights of one being and another, um, they should be resolved on the basis of what's be best for the earth community as a whole, because we all depend on the earth community. It is the ultimate container for, for all of us. And specifically, we need effective legal remedies to ensure that when humans violate the rights of others, there is accountability and that a, a kind of restorative justice is applied. In other words, the emphasis is not on punishing people and sending them to prison or finding them, the emphasis is to restore the damaged relationships. Now, one of the, one of the ways, uh, there are many techniques for applying this approach, but one of the best known is rights of nature. Um, and the idea with rights of nature is, first of all, to recognize that other beings have certain fundamental inalienable rights, including the rights to exist and to play their role within the community of life. Um, and secondly, and perhaps more importantly, to give rise to the corresponding duties on humans to respect those rights and to prevent them being violated and to restore uh, to restore the harm, um, uh, any harm that might have been done by a, a violation. So when one talks about the rights of nature to lawyers or people who've been trained in the Western way of thinking, it first sounds very strange because um, by definition, uh, objects, nature's defined as objects and shouldn't be able to have rights. But the very fact that it jars raises the question about, do we live in a world, a vast collection of objects, um, or do we live amidst a community of, of beings um, that we must maintain good relationships with? 
And that immediately introduces the language of relationships and relatedness, which reflects the reality of, of the universe that we're part of. And so when we do this, um, we are really trying to apply this ecocentric perspective where we recognize that humans are not the center of the universe. We're not separate, we're not superior, and we're not the most Sorry, important. Sorry, Cormac, to interrupt, just one more minute. Thanks. Thank you. And um, the, uh, what, what that means is that, um, sorry, I just lost it. The, the, um, so so we're, trying, we, we're trying to apply the understanding that um, we are part of this community of life and that in order to govern ourselves as part of that community of life, we need to develop devices or techniques within human governance systems which allow us to better regulate human behavior. And one of the ways of doing that is to recognize that when we go to court on behalf of one of these other beings, whether it be a monkey or a mountain um, or a whale, and argue that their particular rights are being violated and that they ought to be um, taken into account. And why that's important is because if we claim to have human rights, these human rights must be contextualized and weighed against the rights of all of these other beings. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Cormac. And sorry for making you lose your train of thought there. Um, I'll now hand over to Ngozi. Thank you very much, Katrina. Um, and I really want to say, well, first of all, hello to everyone. And thank you very much to Cormac, who has laid a very strong premise for my presentation. I will right here. OK. So. OK, so I will just emphasize um, two major things that um, really came out of Cormac's presentation that are going to um, form the context of what I'm going to talk about. So it's more like emphasizing and accentuating. The first one is that um, jurisprudence is not a branch of environmental law, rather it's an ecocentric approach to law and governance, very apt. And then the second one is that um, et jurisprudence or EJ as um, I, I would like to call it most times, is a holistic working of the community of life. So now what Comac has established is that um, applying S jurisprudence to ecological issues is, um, is a next to nothing approach that we really cannot do without it. You know, it's the et jurisprudence strategies are virtually the most effective strategies to deal with ecological issues because ecological issues actually deal with the relationship between humans and non-human entities. That's all the elements of nature. So every man-provoked anthropocentric or man-related environmental degradation has made calls for definition of this relationship imperative and cannot be ignored. What this means is, if we're going to repair this relationship or going to sustain this relationship between the elements of nature, between human and non-human entities, then we have to bring in, we have to co-opt, we have to um, give preference to the strategies or the, the approach of S jurisprudence. The health of the communities that live on earth depend on health of mother earth herself because all beings derive their lives from nature the community. And I'm sure most of us here are very much familiar with the Ubuntu ideology. So if we comprehend this simple fact, human societies can only flourish if they regulate themselves as part of the wider Earth community. So um, how healthy we as a human community are is a function of how healthy the Earth community is herself. So any attempt to exploit or destroy Mother Earth or other beings or components will lead to the destruction of humans themselves. This is what Earth jurisprudence actually portends. So anything that has to do with the relationship between humans and nature would still go back to the core of Earth 
jurisprudence. Now let's look at um, Africa's approach to ecological crisis. We know already that as a developing continent, Africa faces huge environmental degradation, whether internally generated or externally induced. Livelihood is mostly, is mostly eco-based and so is the exploitation of the environment through laundering, fishing, bush burning, and other means that have become inevitable, of course. So in the same way as a developing continent, though industrialization and technical development have positive sides, which include economic growth, there are negative repercussions on environment such as depletion of natural resources and degradation of the environment. I think this is common knowledge for um, the, the average human, not just the average African. The, the impact of development, technology, and so on on the environment. So now with all of this um, background of ecological crisis and environmental deg degradation in Africa, Africa clearly bears the brunt of these environmental challenges like we know. So what then should the response be? Now we are talking in the context of Earth jurisprudence. Is Earth jurisprudence something that is familiar to the average African? How do we apply this um, communitarian ideology? How do we apply this um, I am because we are ideology of Earth jurisprudence to Africa? We'll find that people like Jan, Hume, and Hegel have one time or the other concluded that whites have more time for nature than blacks. Put in another way, whites have more regard, more respect, would rather protect nature more than blacks do. Now let's forget about the terminologies of whites and black. Do we in Africa actually um, regard nature as we should? Or is there such a gross disregard for nature on the African continent? Let's not be too quick to answer. If this is not a true perception of the African's relationship with the environment, then let us begin to unpack what jurisprudence actually means to the African. Is it actually an alien ideology? Is it something that we've never heard anything about? Is this something that you're going to put a, a square peg in a round hole? What does it really mean to the African now that we're saying the jurisprudence approach is actually a very effective when it comes to ecological crisis? So in disproving this, it's going to be important, like I said, to unpack the um, African eco-philosophy so the environmental ideas, the ecological ideas that stem from African spirituality. Now we're going to do this, not just as a way of self-affirmation or self-realization, but to demonstrate that S jurisprudence is in no way colonial or alien to the African milieu within the context of our eco-spirituality. We're going to show this in, in the next few minutes. Hopefully I can achieve this. So that word there is, um, spirituality. So in the course of doing this, it becomes important for us to see that more urgently than before, like yesterday, we need a systematic articulation and promotion of African eco-philosophy that creates an impetus for the implementation or the um, application of earth jurisprudence on the continent. Now let's look at the, diff the, the similarities between jurisprudence and African philosophy, philosophy. This is not to say, like a quick disclaimer here, this is not to say that um, African eco-philosophy is on all fours with jurisprudence or the other way around. But what is simply saying is that there's such a strong similarity, there's such a strong basis for comparison between jurisprudence and African philosophy for us to just ignore um, the principles of jurisprudence. This is how. The principle of jurisprudence, um, for instance, one of the principles of jurisprudence is wholeness. 
And this is akin to the principle of African philo eco-philosophy, which is belongingness. Now, for these two principles, we find that the earth is a single community, as Cormac said, and the well-being of each member of the earth is dependent on the well-being of the whole earth. So you harm one, you harm all. The second one is lawfulness and the rights of the earth, which Cormac also mentioned very much also similar to the African eco-philosophy principles of symbolism and then the cause effect. So if you destroy the relationship between humans and non-humans, we're certainly going to bear the consequences as we started to see with the COVID-19 and um, other epidemics and pandemics in the past, and hopefully not in the future, you know, if we, um, adhere to some of these things. So now under this principle, we find out that all the elements of nature have a right to be, they have a right to habitat, and they have a right to fill their roles in ever renewing process of earth community. So just leave them and let them fulfill their vital processes in the earth. On the principle of duty of care, under S jurisprudence, we also have solidarity and respect under African eco-philosophy. What does this principle say? It says that humans have responsibility to care for and protect members of the Earth community. And they're also supposed to maintain the integrity of the Earth and future generations. I'm going to move a little faster because I have a feeling my time is running out. Now to the principle of mutual enhancement akin again to the principle of relationship on the African eco-philosophy. And this principle simply says that relationship within the community are reciprocal. So I give you, the, I give the earth this and the earth gives me back this. I give the earth carbon dioxide and the earth gives me back oxygen. So when one is cut off, then there's a lopsided relationship and in no distant future, there's going to be chaos. For the principle of resilience we have on the African eco-philosophy, the principle of harmony and cosmological balance. Here, healthy living systems should be able to grow and evolve, adapt to disturbance without losing their integrity. So I'm sure we've also heard a lot about ecological integrity and so on and harmony with nature. So this is where it stems from. So the idea of all of this is that, um, there's really no separating a jurisprudence from African eco-philosophy. There's nothing strange about a jurisprudence in Africa if we actually put it within the context of African eco-philosophy. So it's more like renaming a concept for it to be able to work in Africa. If that's what makes us feel better, let's call it self-realization, self-affirmation or whatever it is, but it is not an alien ideology. Now, having said this, we have established three main things. We have established the fact that um, as jurisprudence approaches are actually very effective or more effective so far when it comes to ecological crisis. We have established that um, as jurisprudence is not alien per se to Africa because it is very much akin to the principles of African philosophy. We have also established, Cormac actually did so, that um, the threats to nature cannot be fixed by the same legal framework that has caused climate change and ecological dis destruction. It is not possible because the foundation is already faulty. Now the question is how can legislation of African eco-philosophy now transform the dominant or existing legal system? The first way of course is to treat the elements of nature as members of one community as a foundation for dealing with root causes of ecological, social, economic, and justice challenges. The second way is to protect the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities to their natural sites. Why do they need the protection? Why should their rights be protected? Their rights should be protected because these are actually custodians and stewards of this protective ethic that Earth jurisprudence portends of this protective ethic that is the core, is at the core of earth jurisprudence. They understand how best to relate to nature. They understand how much of nature we are part of and not a part of, apart from or superior to. 
Thirdly, um, the rights in constitution should cover the rights of nature, which I'm sure we, we know we've been singing all over the place, and I'm sure the next speaker is going to talk about. So not just having these rights protected in constitution, but the elements of nature should be able to defend themselves. So they should have standing in courts. Now, such constitutional provisions will reflect the recognition that our human existence is dependent on the well-being of the larger earth. Until that is done, any other strategies or any other approaches will be like um, a faint approach to the preservation of nature and ecological integrity. So essentially, Sorry, Ngozi, um, one more minute when I see you come Thank to you. End. Thank you. Essentially, what this um, presentation is saying is that if questions of justice to the environment cannot be addressed without reference to humans, that's to the individual, if the cry of the earth should be heard simultaneously with the cry of the poor, then Africa must begin to insist on its communal ontology, namely, what happens to one happens to all. Thank you. Um, I think I might on time with that one. Thanks so much, Ngozi, for ending on that powerful note. I'll now hand over to Natalia. Thank you so much for the space. I just wanted to say hi to Katrina, to Cormac, to Nonji. It's a real pleasure to be here with you guys. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now um, so I can share the presentation. Can you, Katrina, can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it and hear you well. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So I'll start my time. Thank you so much for, for the space. It's, it's a pleasure of being here and it's a pleasure to see how the African Hub is growing. And I'm really proud that you guys are holding this space. Uh, as Katrina was mentioning, uh, I I'm part of GARN. I was one of the founders with, of GARN with Cormac a long time ago in 2010. And it's been a pleasure to see how this movement has grown so much. So today, what I'm going to speak to you guys about is how this global movement has grown and how it arose in my country, in Ecuador, eh, that was the first country to recognize it in our constitution. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and just uh, uh, remind you of something that Karma was sharing, that is that we need a new paradigm and that definitely uh, the paradigm of, of, of environmental law has not been enough. I really like what Cormac was sharing about uh, the example with slavery because I just feel that uh, with that example, it's very clear to everybody that environmental law is just telling us how much we can hit our slave, but it's not telling us that nature is not a slave, that nature is not an object, that nature has a right to exist, and that we need to redefine our relationship with nature, and that that's the most important thing that we need to be doing. So I want to show you a little bit, I, I like this timeline, we still are updating 2022, but I like this timeline because this movement was very insipid at the beginnings in the in early 1972, we had Christopher Stones writing about should trees have standings that the movement didn't really grow that much. In 2006, we had a little town in the US called Tamaqua Ruro that uh, recognized the rights of nature in its local uh, ordinance. But it was especially in 2008 that we were able to recognize it in our constitution that the movement really like started growing and growing. Um, so yes, I, if, if you wanna see it and if you can uh, see, see my screen, I have my constitution right here with me. It's on, on the side of my uh, computer all the time because it uh, fortunately has become a really powerful element and tool for our work here in Ecuador. And we indeed were able to pass the constitution in, in the constitution in 2008, uh, we recognize that nature is a subject of rights we have a whole chapter, chapter seven, that recognizes the nature or Pachamama, which is really interesting. It's not only nature, it's the concept of the indigenous concept of Pachamama that recognizes that includes not only the nature that we can see, but also the cosmos and the spiritual nature it has, has rights and has the right to exist, has the right to maintain its natural cycles, so it has a right to flourish and has the right to integral regeneration, which is really uh, amazing because that's uh, especially one of the things that we've, we're going uh, to courts to. And one of the articles in our constitution also says that any activity that can lead to extinction of species it should be a, a change or prohibited. And that, that provision has also allowed us to go into court a, 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 in the name of, 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 the, of, of nature. A, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. 
So here's a picture of when we started back in 2010. And it was right after this big conference that happened in Bolivia, the Conference of the People for Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth, that we decided that it wasn't so uh, we weren't so uh, so so crazy only in Ecuador and Bolivia, but there were more crazy people around the world, and that we should gather around and and create this uh, this this global alliance. And I'm really happy to see that now it has grown, and now we have many uh, regional hubs: uh, the Latin American hub, the European hub, the African hub. We're hoping that we'll have a an Asian hub and North American hub soon. But we also have thematic hubs: the legal hub, the youth hub, the academic hub, and the Indigenous Council. So uh, that that has happened, it, and also because uh, now. Uh, 37 countries have adopted rights of nature in some uh, way or another. We have a various levels of how this has happened. Uh, we have only Ecuador that has uh, gotten into its constitution. We're crossing our fingers and I'm asking you to cross your fingers too and send all your energy to Chile that is going to vote in September 4th. To, yes, that's the sign to, of the approval. That's the sign uh, to approve the constitution. If uh, it's hard, it's challenging, but if Chile is able to uh, pass this project of a new constitution, that will be the second country in the world to recognize the rights of nature. But we have many examples, uh, many, some cases that have been won, some cases uh, only for, for a river or a court case uh, or a, you know, the example of some um, some cities that have passed rights of nature ordinances, and that has allowed us to count that we have at least 37 countries that have advanced in some way the rights of nature. So this is definitely a growing movement. So uh, you can see the whole uh, timeline in our website in garden.org, but I wanted to, to share a little bit about uh, what we have that is, as I was saying, sharing that in 2010, we had a people's conference, we formed GARN, then we had in 2012, this great, really great approach of New Zealand that the Maori people in New Zealand uh, reached an agreement to leave the one, to give the Wanganui River, a, a, a recognize it as a legal persona. And that was very interesting because it was combining a, a sort of like, it was a restitution of rights to the Maori people, but also to the Wanganui River. And the moment, the movement has grown a lot, as I was saying, we have, uh, many really nice cases, especially in Latin America, for example, in 2018, the Colombian court recognized the, um, and the Colombian Amazon as a subject of rights. It also has a really interesting case about the Atrato River. It gave rights to the Atrato River. We have amazing cases like Bangladesh, a high court that gave uh, all legal, legal, uh, legal rights to all the rivers in, in Bangladesh. Uh, Ohio in 2019 adopted the Bill of Rights uh, to, the, uh, to the Lake Erie. Uh, and I wanted to stop a little bit for Latin America because I feel that we have a lot of advances for Latin America. As I was saying, the Atlanta River that was uh, uh, was enshrined in 2016. Peru has a Bill of Rights that has been presented. It's not been applied yet. We have a lot of interesting th things happening and presenting a Bill of Rights in Argentina although that hasn't happened yet. But Mexico is very interesting. We have cities like Guerrero, Mexico City, Colima, Oaxaca, that have recognized the rights of nature. Chile, as I was saying, is about to have it. Bolivia has an ombudsman and has a national law for the rights of nature. And Brazil has many um, municipalities that recognize the rights of nature. We in Ecuador have an observatory that is a legal observatory for the rights of nature, which already has 120 court rulings and 56 cases of uh, the rights of nature, most of them uh, favorable to, uh, to nature. Uh, as we were saying, actually one of the, uh, the re reasons and, and, and ways that we've been able to grow with, with, with the rights of nature is by having these international rights of nature tribunals that have allowed us to normalize the concept of rights of nature and take it to the world uh, in what Cormac was saying, all beings have the, rights, uh, the right to exist. And it's not only that, uh, that it has happen in, here in Ecuador that we recognize the rights of nature, but this is something happening worldwide because we have a system that is, a, that, that is a preventing a nature to flourish. And we can further talk in the question discussion about many of the really interesting topics that you have shared as questions. But yes, it actually can and should start a, a stopping economic development because we know that a growth cannot keep on happening in a, in a planet in, because we only have one planet. So we have to limit growth. We have to limit a, a economic, economic growth. And we have to understand that nature has its limits and we have overpassed its limits. 
And we see this all the time with international rights of nature tribunals. We've been able to hold them in, in Ecuador, in Quito, in Lima, in Paris, in Bonn, in Chile, in Europe. And we recently held one in Glasgow that allowed us to go. Actually, I was I had the pleasure to travel with Cormac to Brazil because the International Rights of Nature delegation from this tribunal went to visit in the Amazon as a threatened living entity in Brazil and see what is happening in Brazil and how there are sacrifice zones in Brazil in Brazilian Amazon that is really leading to uh, the Brazilian Amazon to its tipping point. So Coming back to Ecuador, as I, as I promised, I just wanted to, to share with you that we have really amazing cases. Uh, some of them have been selected by the Constitutional Court. Some of them, like the Piatua River, allow you to see the difference between rights of nature and uh, environmental rights, because uh, the Piatua River, for example, had all the permits for a hydroelectric dam, but this was impeded uh, by, an, uh, by a court because we were able to show that some species were going to uh, uh, were going to be extinct if this dam was presented. So under the environmental law paradigm, the Piatua River Dam will have continued, but we were able to stop it with rights of nature provisions. Uh, one case that I really want to, if, if you guys are interested to share with you guys is the case of Los Cedros. Uh, we had last year the recognition of the constitutional court that a, a mining should be prohibited in Los Cedros protected forests. Mining, unfortunately, is an activity that is a, that can happen in protected forests uh, because it's it, it's it be, minerals belong to the state. But uh, there's a really beautiful uh, a verdict uh, about Los Cedros case that shows that it's such a biodiverse place and it's such a pristine and, and sensitive place that any activity can cause the extinction of many species. And that is why the Constitutional Court ruled in favor of the rights of nature and against mining in this really emblematic case. And now we're actually in court for these two frogs, uh, for the Rana Nodriza Confusa and the Rana Arlequino Sicuda, that are two little frogs that were found uh, right in the place where uh, Codelco, the mining company from Chile, wants to develop an open pit mine. Uh, and that mine, uh, mining company will definitely threaten uh, the life of these species. So uh, the rights of nature provisions in Ecuador have allowed us to go to court in favor of these species that are actually umbrella species because of course, we uh, by protecting them, we're protecting many other species. But um, we're still litigating about this, but it's really interesting to see how the discourse has changed in, in a place like Ecuador, where we can actually uh, go to court for these species and say that those species also have the right to exist. And of course, we can see, and you can imagine all the, in, the powerful interests of the mining companies that are very close to the state trying to overrule this and trying to go a, a on top of what we have for the rights of nature in our constitution, but uh, the provisions that we have in the constitution have allowed us to fight in court for this. And that's also, that's already very interesting. And I'm running out of time. So I just wanted to say that this change has to, to uh, happen everywhere. And that if we haven't noticed that with, with the pandemic uh, telling us that we are so fragile and that we need to change, we will definitely disappear. And for me, the rights of nature paradigm is definitely a paradigm that is allowing us to awake in a moment of, of a lot of urgency in the world. So I'll leave it here, just leaving you the contacts, uh, my contact and Garen's website, the Rights of Nature website, and the uh, local observatory in Ecuador that's called Derechos de la Naturaleza or DC. So thank you so much. And I'm really happy to uh, answer all of those amazing questions that I see already in the chat. Thanks so much, Nati. Um, it was really fantastic to be reminded of the amazing history and and the global nature of this movement um, and, and the work that has kind of come over the last uh, decade or two or three. Um, so there have been some really fantastic questions in the chat, and I don't think we'll have an opportunity to necessarily get through all of them. So I've tried to select a few for each of the speakers, um, which cover kind of a few of the topics that have um, come up that have come up in the chat. Um, I thought maybe for Cormac, um, there's a question from Ollie Hurst. Um, he asks, regarding post-humanism and rights of nature, specifically, personhood models which extend human rights to, for example, a forest should, or how can we apply existing conventions of law to non-human beings as this reignites discussions on what it means to be human? So I thought I can keep that for Cormac. And then for Ngozi, um, there's a question um, 
also actually from Ollie Hurst, um, as Earth jurisprudence is informed and developed from indigenous worldviews, when applying it to Western societies, how do we avoid indigenous knowledge? Um, to how do we avoid that indigenous knowledge isn't hijacked or face the unjust outcome as with the stealing of indigenous lands by European colonists? How can we ensure social justice within this alternative future? And maybe linked to that, there's another question that says, it appears that current global legal systems are based on historical religious colonization. How do we address this? Um, and then for Nati, you touched on this a little bit, but I thought you could maybe expand re regarding economic development. So there've been two questions in, in the chat. One, at what point does economic development through natural resource extraction and use relate to rights of nature? That is, how does rights of nature promote economic development or does rights of nature promote economic development? And then a second one related to that is, government and corporations may see rights of nature as an obstacle to economic development. How do we convince corporations and governments not to perceive rights of nature as impediment to economic development, rather as a tool for sustainable, de sustainable development? Um, maybe Cormac, you can start and then we can go in the same order. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Katrina. So a lot of people um, uh, react to the idea of, of calling um, aspects of nature, like say a river or a mountain, a, a legal person for the, for the purposes of say arguing in, in court. And some people see this as a way of sort of personifying or, um, nature and as it were bringing an anthropocentric approach in the back door. But I don't think that's the intention. The intention. So interestingly, the word legal personality comes from the Latin persona, which originally referred to a mask that people wore in, in theater. Um, so if you went to a play in ancient Greece, you could tell by the mask the person was wearing whether they were a baddie or a goodie, or, you know, what role they played in the drama. And so the mask was not the actor. It was, it was a signifier of, of the, the role so that you could understand their role in the drama. And it's a bit like that when one goes to court, one wears a mask as maybe a landowner or um, whatever. And so by the, the reason for um, saying that a river should have legal personality in the sense of standing to, to appear in court is not to pretend that the river is like a real person, but to simply say, if you wear this mask, then you can be seen in the drama of the courtroom and not be simply the backdrop like, um, like is the, ca the case now. So it's just a device by, by which we can get humans to recognize the reality that there are beings with, with rights that are not humans and that are not corporations or, or the state. So I think that um, it is a, it's an important um, technique, but there are other techniques. And what's really important is to get people to see that we are not masters of this universe. Our role is not to manage everything else. Our, our role is to relate and to try and coexist um, harmoniously within this natural community of life. Thanks, Komak. Um, Gozi, please go ahead. Okay, so um, the two questions are actually very closely related. One of them that has to do with um, indigenous knowledge and its recognition and not preventing it from being overwhelmed by Western knowledge or colonized. And the second one is on the legal system. So I think I would like to take them together. Now, um, when it comes to indigenous knowledge, knowledge itself actually means not just what is presented, but the basis of it, what the foundation is that brought about that knowledge itself, the beliefs that brought about the knowledge itself. So when we're saying recognize indigenous knowledge, we're not saying um, just take the bits that suits you and dispense with the other parts that is not very palatable to you. Now, this is not to say that there are some aspects of indigenous knowledge that are not repugnant to natural justice, equity, and good conscience. No, we're saying two different things here. So anytime it has to do with something that is harmful to the human or even harmful to the environment, we are clearly dispensing with that. But we are not totally removing the fact that these people believe in these things and um, indigenous knowledge actually contributes to the preservation of nature itself. So any any approach or any movement that has to do with emphasizing the use of indigenous knowledge is actually 
de-emphasizing colonialism. So when you're bringing in indigenous knowledge to, um, let's say, and let's say um, a policy on jurisprudence, for instance, you're bringing in these people's beliefs. You're bringing in the basis for which they are making the claims that they are making. You're bringing in the respect for the people themselves. They're bringing in um, what ideas they have. If you have, it's, it's, it's juxtaposing Western science and indigenous knowledge most times. That's what we see um, being propagated. But the, the understanding there is that when you're bringing in Western science and indigenous knowledge, you're going to reach a compromise and you're still going to end up being, um, it's still going to end up being colonized. What we see, we have to be very, very careful when it comes to those kind of things. So moving on to the aspect of legal systems. When we are talking about legal systems, that's why we are now bringing it within the context of Africa. When we're talking about legal systems, we have to insist that it has to be how the Africans understand it, how the Africans have done it, how it has worked for the Africans over generations, and how we can upscale it to be beneficial to nature as a community itself. So we're not looking for ideas to be superimposed, to make it look refined. That's where the error usually comes from. We want it indigenous, we want it African, we want it the way we know it or understand it. And then we can start looking for ways to expand it and propagate it to become laws, to become a solid legal system and to have a solid paradigm shift. So essentially what I'm saying is um, a lot of care needs to be taken when incorporating in quotes indigenous knowledge and so on to prevent any form of tainted colonialism. It's very delicate, but with little steps like this that we are mentioning, bringing the right people to the table, bringing the right conversations up and so on, it's very, very possible. There are steps in the right direction. Thanks so much, Ngozi. Um, I'll now hand over to Natalia. Sure, thank you, Katrina. Thank you for the amazing questions. I feel that we can have, we'll, we can be discussing about this for a very long time. I, I wanted to, to just uh, tell you before I go into the part of economic development, two things. I just feel that uh, as, as I showed you of what's going on in the world, we are actually going to launch uh, air jurisprudence monitor in October that where you're going to be able to see everything that is happening in the world and I love this image because I just feel that we're doing like acupuncture to the world you know we're having all these places where like rights of nature is coming up and we're just trying to heal the world with this acupuncture rights of nature and of course as 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 you may well know we we the the better the more the better so if we have more cases of course we can heal the earth faster and uh, what we need with the earth is really Really definitely a, a, a restructuring of our our relationship with the with the earth and with nature and I think that that's what indigenous people have been telling us for a long time and of course uh, when I, I just wanted to share with you that this in, in Ecuador what happened was not a movement that came from the bottom to up it was from, more from bottom to to uh, uh, from top to bottom because it wasn't like a big movement that brought the idea to the uh, to the constitution it was actually something that was happening around the world the, all these ideas were coming and we were changing our constitution and we were able to include it in our constitution and then now that we have it in the constitution it has actually been hard and difficult to bring it down but now we have a basis of people who understand it especially youth that have have had it for 14 years and who don't question any longer if nature should have rights or not they're just asking our governments why aren't you applying the rights of nature truly you know but having that i think that is amazing because um people question oh but you still have like oil development and mine development well yes and you know like human rights are still there and uh, we're human rights are still being violated after more than 60 years of 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 having them in on a declaration but it's, it was very important to recognize them so as long even though we have not been able to change the world immediately with the rights of nature it's very important to enforce rights of nature provisions to start making that change especially that ideological change uh, and i wanted to share this because regarding the notion of indigenous people. I remember some indigenous people with whom we were working during the assembly 
assembly, we were saying, well, we're discussing this in the assembly. And one of them asked me, well, you didn't have it already, you know? So for indigenous people, of course, that recognize and, and realize and, and understand that nature is our mother and that we're part of nature, it was so ridiculous that our old constitution didn't recognize that nature has, was subject of rights. So I think that that rationality of, the, of, of rights of nature being something so obvious is that what it should, it's something that should it push us and should promote us to to be saying and telling our governments and telling our communities, of course, you know, like this system maybe a response, like this distraction responds to the fact that this has not been included into law and that's why we need to push it into law and also push it communicationally. And regarding economic development, uh, I definitely think that is a tool for sustainable development because I agree that we need to have well, in Ecuador, our constitution not only recognizes the rights of nature, but it also recognizes something called a buen vivir or summa causa, well-being as a model of development. So not a capitalist model of development. We don't wanna copy a, the Northern countries. We wanna have our own development that it doesn't only require, and it's not a, translated into economic growth development should be looked at and should be understood as a better quality of life for people, not necessarily only as economic growth, because we know that economic growth has only uh, led to disparities, to a lot of like growth concentration, and not really to like a better life for human beings. But if we can guarantee the life of nature and a better a relationship with nature, then we can definitely have a better life as humans. So yes, economic, some people might think and might see this as an impediment for economical, economic growth, uh, but it's a grow, if it's a growth that is going to a uh, harm nature, and it's, I, I like this, this idea of thinking that you can, harm nature when you cut a tree, but that tree is going to uh, grow again. But if you do like open pit mining, or if you do like a, a big a oil spill, you're cutting down like the, the arms of nature and that's not growing and going to grow back again. So if that economic growth is going to cut the arms of nature and is going to impede its regeneration, then yes, that economic growth should be stopped. And we should find different ways of relating to nature and different ways of development and of getting a better life for humans and for nature in understanding that we are completely interrelated. So it's a whole different idea of how to think about sustainable development, very away from this green growth and green, green development that is a, a still thinking that we can take and take from nature and not understanding that since we are part of nature, we're harming nature and harming ourselves. Thank you so much, Nati, Cormac, and Gozi. I think you managed to respond to our questions really fantastically. And I hope everyone in the audience is feeling as kind of inspired um, as I am. I've certainly learned a lot today. Um, and I think we had a great diversity of speakers. You all spoke from really different angles, um, but speaking essentially about the same message um, that I think a lot of the audience really resonated with. So thanks again to all three of you. Um, this has been the first of our events as the African Hub, um, and it's been really fantastic to, to share it with you all as the panelists and the audience. We're planning a whole range of um, activities as we grow. Um, and so we'd really encourage you to join the Hub, follow us on Facebook, send us an email. We've put all of these details um, in the chat and, and get in touch with us. We, as, as the African Hub and, and Ghana in general as an alliance, we really are about kind of the strength of our membership um, and the organizations that participate. So we um, look forward to hearing from many of you and we hope that you enjoyed today's session. Thank you all and have a good evening um, in most parts of Africa. Bye everyone.